Good morning, good afternoon or evening. Be it Sunday or Monday, or even Friday or Saturday. Thank you for joining us for worship at the Peninsula Churches. You are more than welcome. I always think it's a good thing to take a moment as we come together to worship God for some silence, some peace. So I ask you just to close your eyes, to concentrate on your breathing and try and forget about your worries and instead just let yourself be open to the presence of God. Let us listen now to the word of God taken from Ephesians. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music for your heart to the Lord always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When the rain is pouring When the winds are blowing And it feels like It's always gonna be this way Let us pray. God of many names, none of which is adequate to describe you. 
perhaps instead of searching for the right words, we should simply be silent and draw as close to you as we dare. Will we be dazzled by the light or enfolded in loving arms? Let's try it and see. God of compassion and restorative grace, instead of listing all our faults and asking for forgiveness, perhaps we should simply sit beside you and look at ourselves and our world, as far as we can, from your point of view. Will we see deliberate wrongdoing or well-meaning people doing their best and sometimes getting it wrong? Confused or hurting or fearful ones, not knowing where to turn. Let us try it and see. God of many aspects and one eternal truth, thank you for hearing our prayers and guiding our thoughts, for comforting and challenging, reassuring or inspiring us according to our need. We give you our thanks and our praise. Amen. This week's Old Testament reading is reading from Job, verses chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. In the land of us there lived a man whose name was Job. The man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. And from chapter 2. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going to and fro in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to, your, to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat amongst the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. The second reading is from Luke chapter 13, reading from verses 31 to 35. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent, stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. The opening words of Job have an odd feel to them. Kind of like a once upon a time fairy tale. You can almost hear it. Once upon a time there was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless. So far, so Cinderella. But then things change and go dark very quickly. Even darker than a Disney princess story. And why? Well, not because of anything Job had done. 
that's made very clear, but actually for the totally opposite reason, because he was blameless. That fact, and that fact alone, was to cause him more problems than he could ever have imagined. At the start of the book, Job was living a relatively happy life. He had a wife, seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 team of oxen and 500 female donkeys. But by the end of today's reading, which remember was only chapter two, he had lost everything apart from his wife. He had lost his children, his health, his wealth and his standing. Not, as many people, including his friends, believed through anything he had done, but rather he lost it all because God was allowing Satan to test Job. For at the start of the book, Satan had come to God and challenged him, saying that Job's faith was not genuine and that if God was to take away all that Job had, he would show his true self and curse God. So God let Satan do his worst, leaving Job with nothing. In fact, at our point in the story, we find him sitting in ashes, covered in painful sores. He is so pitiful, so miserable, so dejected, that his wife, who has lost everything alongside him, says, Are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. Something which was possibly said out of anger. After all, all that was happening to Job was happening to her. But equally, it might have been said out of love because she did not want to see her husband suffer anymore. Whatever the motivation, Job's wife had had it. If this was how God was going to treat Job, a good man, a godly man, then enough was enough. However, Job doesn't curse God. Rather, he says, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? This, I think, is a question that everyone from Adam and Eve to those of us watching today must have wrestled with at some point. For let's be honest, it is much easier to believe in God, to trust in him when things are going well. But when they're not, <laughs> well, maybe that's when our real faith shows. And it's true. Suffering does raise many questions. Questions such as, how can God allow it? Or what have I done to deserve this? How can I believe in God's love when everything around me is falling apart? Or less personally, and more generally, where is God in all the hurt and the pain and the suffering that we see every day in the world around us? And when we start asking these questions, not only are we putting our faith to the test, but in the truth, we're also putting God to the test. Basically asking, what kind of God are you to allow such hurt, pain and misery to happen? If you're all powerful, why don't you intervene? Why do you let good people suffer and bad prosper? How can you call that justice? And the problem is, we don't actually get a clear answer to such questions, but rather we are told to trust, to hope, to have faith in God's plan, a plan that's not always easy to fathom. But then we were never promised an easy life by God, not since Adam and Eve ate that first apple. In fact, we are told in the book of James, my friends, consider yourself fortunate when all kinds of trials come your way. For you know that when your faith succeeds in facing such trials, the result is the ability to endure. Make sure that your endurance carries you all the way without failing. 
so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And maybe that is the message at the heart of the book of Job. Maybe what God is trying to show us is that even, no, make that especially at our lowest, in the most difficult and darkest of situations, we must hold on to our faith in God, which I know from experience is sometimes easier said than done. But Job's story is also a reminder that while suffering is a part of life, and we cannot always control what happens to us, we can control our response to it. Job did not curse God, but he did question him. He asked why God had allowed so much suffering to happen to him. And while he did not receive a direct answer, he did receive something even more profound. He received a deeper understanding of God's power and wisdom. So for those of us who are hurting today, who are broken or struggling, Job lets us know that it's okay to come before God with our questions, even our complaints and our doubts. For God is waiting to hear from us in both the good and the bad times. He is willing to carry us when our burdens get too heavy. How does he do that, you may ask? Well, through scripture and prayer, and yes, sometimes miraculous interventions. God also knew that we would face hardships and tragedies, so he gave us the church. Yes, it's a place to come to worship him, but it's also a family who offers support, strength and love, even in the most difficult of circumstances. How blessed are we to have that? Similarly, though maybe less obviously, our second passage, the Luke reading, is also looking at faith in adversity. For in this passage, we find Jesus dealing with threats from Herod. The Pharisees are warning Jesus to leave the area he is in because Herod wants to kill him. However, Jesus ignores their request, saying, Go tell that fox that I will keep on casting out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will accomplish my purpose. And what a purpose that was. Like the Job story, the passage from Luke teaches us important lessons about faith and commitment. Jesus knew that his faithfulness to God would ultimately lead to his suffering and death. For he goes on to say, Yes, today, tomorrow and the next day, I must proceed on my way. For it would not, be for a, for it would not do for a prophet of God to be killed except in Jerusalem. You see, Jesus did not waver from his purpose. He remained steadfast in his mission to bring salvation to the world, no matter the cost. Even in the face of intense opposition. That doesn't mean that following God's chosen path was easy for Jesus. You just have to listen to the words he said in Gethsemane to understand this. Luke tells us that Jesus went off from the disciples about the distance of a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. Father, he said, if you will, take this cup of suffering away from me. Not my will, however, but your will be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. In great anguish he prayed even more fervently. His sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Father, if it is your will, take this cup of suffering from me. How many times have you or I prayed these same words and appeared to receive the same answer that Jesus did? 
minus the angel. Yet we gather online today because even in our darkest places, in our own Gethsemanes, we know that we need God, that we need his light to guide us, even if we do not understand the path he's taking us on. So today, two very different passages, but both teaching a similar lesson, that faith is not just about believing in God when the going is good, but we must also persevere in our faith when we're facing trials and tribulations. These passages teach us about trusting in God's plan, even when it seems hard or unfair. In other words, what they are teaching us is that we must learn to be like Job and Jesus, standing firm in our beliefs and remaining faithful to God, even in the face of adversity, even when nothing seems to make sense. This lesson can be seen again and again in the life of the faithful, from Job to Jesus, to Martin Luther and Cory Ten Boom. Faith in the face of suffering has been something that believers always had to deal with. For none of us escapes life unscathed. It's just a question of how we deal with the hurt and the pain that makes the difference. We can either blame God and turn from him or accept that while life is hard, our perseverance and steadfastness will ultimately lead to a deeper understanding of God's love and grace. And not only that, it will also lead to the greatest gift of all, eternal life. And what an amazing reward that will be. Praise God and Amen. Let us pray our prayers for others and ourselves. God of all times, all places and all people, we have reflected today on ancient stories which remind us just how little has changed over the centuries, how much we still need your help in times of trouble whether those troubles come suddenly out of nowhere or whether they are of our own making. We pray for any we know or whose stories have touched us, who have had one tragedy after another, more sadness in a short space of time than anyone could be expected to bear. Some will have had faith to sustain them. For others, their experience will have struck at the roots of everything they once believed. May our prayers reach through somehow and give them some of the support they will need as they grieve and recalibrate and learn to face life with confidence again. We pray for those who have to watch as a loved one suffers, unable to take away their pain or even sometimes to reach them in their darkness. Some families and friendships will grow stronger in times of trouble. Some will struggle and fail, but all will be affected one way or another. God who weeps with us when we weep and celebrates with us when things go well, be with those whom we have remembered. Remind us of, of others whom we may have forgotten and who also need our prayers and our practical support. Fill us with the spirit that Christ promised would be ours when he was gone, so that we may continue the work that he began in the world until his kingdom comes in all its peace and goodness. Amen. Let us come now to dedicate our gifts to God. God, we have been told that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Maybe we should allow that blessing now and again, rather than come to you with gifts that may not be what you most need or want. If Jesus is our guide to your essential being, then perhaps there are times when all you want is to give us the help we need to get out of some mess that we have got ourselves into. And it grieves you that we either cannot see the problem 
or will not accept the help that you so badly want to give. Here in this place that for most of us feels safe as well as sacred, may we lay down whatever we are carrying, including our gifts and good intentions. May we come with open hands and hearts to receive your blessing and so become a blessing to others. And we ask all of this with the words that Jesus taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Then God who laid the earth's foundations Then God who's Lord of every nation Then God who tends each generation He's here Then God who left His throne so Now as our worship draws to our close and as we leave this space, may we know that we are loved, may we know that we are cared for, may we know that even in the wildest of storms, God is with us. May the ever-present, compassionate and comforting God, Son and Spirit be with us all today, tomorrow and forevermore. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine.
shine upon. 